Good morning, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your interest in this plenary which will be dealing with international initiatives for the safe and sustainable use of outer space. This is a panel about politics, law, diplomacy, but also about the issues of how to use outer space. My name is Kai Schrogel. I'm from the European Space Agency and also affiliated with the International Institute of Space Law. And I will be co-moderator together with Ken Hodgkins, uh, whom you see at the other end of the table from the US Department of State. Uh, this uh, plenary is organized by the International Institute of Space Law and uh, a number of personalities here on the podium are representing the IISL as well as other institutes related to space law, but don't be afraid. It will not only be law or legal issues which will be discussed, but it will be, as I said, politics as well as technology. So I would like to introduce uh, to you the podium before Ken will introduce uh, you to the topic. Uh, starting uh, from my right is Dr. Horikawa. He is the chairman of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which is the highest intergovernmental body globally, which is dealing with the use, the status, and in particular international cooperation in outer space comprising almost 70 member states. Next to him is Tare Prisibe. He is the chairman of the legal subcommittee of UN Corporus, which itself is the highest body for space lawmaking and regulations. He's followed by Sherab Rache, who has uh, a lot of functions amongst which uh, he is representing here the governmental group of experts which has been established by the UN Secretary General uh, in order to look into the issue of how transparency and confidence building measures can improve the use of outer space. He is followed by Sergio Marchisio, who is the president of the uh, European Center of Space Law, ECSL, and also a board member of the International Institute of Space Law. And he is uh, representing, while he is also uh, um, participating and a member of a number of uh, international fora, he is representing here the European initiative of a code of conduct for outer space activities. Uh, he is followed by Dr. Murti, who has previously been with the uh, Prime Minister's Office of India and who will provide uh, a specific uh, view of uh, India and uh, also developing countries uh, for the uh, use of outer space. We then have uh, Professor Li Shuping from the uh, Beijing Institute for Technology. He will cover uh, in particular uh, aspects which are related to technology. And uh, at the end of the table, uh, we have Jana Robinson from the European Space Policy Institute, expert in space security and uh, transparency and confidence building measures, representing uh, the academic field, uh, the think tank field. And with that, I hand over to Ken Hodgkins to introduce you to the topic. Thank you, Kyle. Um Good morning. I appreciate uh, all of you showing up for this panel, se uh, panel session this morning. I think you'll find it extremely fascinating. Uh, what we're going to discuss today are three activities that are taking place in three different distinct fora. The first would be the, uh, e uh, the International Code of Conduct, which has been proposed by the European Union, and uh, that is being uh, discussed through a series of bilateral and multilateral discussions. Then we have the group of government experts on transparency and confidence building measure. And then within the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, we have an agenda item on the long-term sustainability of space activities. The intent is to, create, uh, is to develop a set of what we would call best practices guidelines that would be applicable to government and non-government space activities. Now, I'm, uh, I'm the director of 
of the Office of Space and Advanced Technology in the Department of State. And in that capacity, I'm also the U.S. representative to the U.N. Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And I've been involved in these activities for a number of years. And what I would like all of you to appreciate is that 10 years ago, if you asked me, would we have a panel talking about these issues that would be taken up on a multilateral basis, I would say no because at the time, the political, the technological, the diplomatic um, considerations that would have to go into that were not all converging. Well, over the past few years, those have converged. And what you're seeing, what you'll hear today is a discussion of something that's quite unique. And it, as I say, was not, was not possible just 10 years ago. So with, with that, I guess I'd like to turn it back to Kayu to introduce our first speaker. Yes, and we may be, uh, can start with Dr. Horikawa, and uh, what you certainly also would like to know is what is meant with sustainability or the sustainable use of outer space, and he is perfectly fitted as the chairman of UN Corporus to explain that to you. Thank you, Mr. Shiroge, for your kind introduction. I'm so pleased to be one of the participants of this very important plenary event with such an impressive group of panelists. I'd also like to thank you for the question you posed about the necessity of the uh, sustainable use of outer space. This is a very generic question. Space, science, and technology, and their application, such as satellite communication, Earth observation system, and satellite navigation technologies, provide indispensable tools for achieving viable long-term solutions for sustainable development and can contribute more effectively to, effect, to efforts to promote the development of all countries and regions of the world, to improving people's lives, to conserving natural resources, and to enhancing the preparedness for and mitigation of uh, consequences of disasters. Last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the UN Committee of Peaceful Use of Outer Space. The 50th anniversary declaration, which was adopted at the United Nations General Assembly last year, expressed firm conviction that advances in space science and space exploration serve as the pillars for the operational use of space technology and its application. Thus, there is a need for us to take a closer look at how the recent advances in space science and technology and associated systems, including space exploration activities, might contribute to addressing specific issues of global concern, such as the availability of clean and renewable energy, access to water, better management of land, and coastal natural resources, food security, and wider use of tele-education, telehealth facilities, including the strengthening of capacity building in each of these areas. Similarly, we should also take a closer look at how scientific research in human spaceflight and their spin-offs could become a useful tool to advance development on Earth. In this regard, we have to sustain the use of outer space for all humankind. Existing UN treaties promote the idea that outer space shall be free for exploration and usable by all states without discrimination of any kind on the basis of equality and in accordance with international law and there shall be free access to all areas of celestial bodies. In recent years, the utilization of space has, be, uh, has seen an increasing number of states, non-governmental organizations, private sector entities, and even universities expanding their presence. In an era where we are seeing space becoming increasingly crowded with new players, the need to show strong commitment to sharing responsibilities and acting responsibly in space to help prevent mishap, misperception, and mistrust has never been greater. Therefore, the declaration 
also expressed deep concern about the fragility of the space environment and the challenges to the long-term sustainability of outer space activities, in particular the growing impact of space debris. The environment in space is quite different from conditions on the ground and in the air, and the position of space vehicle cannot be easily changed, as its movement or orbital behavior is strictly constrained to the orbit onto which it has been launched. Therefore, the question on the benefit of space utilization and the long-term sustainability of outer space activity should be taken into account such phenomena. It is important to have close relations and direct communication among those people concerned, and intimate discussions are very important. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker will be uh, Mr. Murthy, and what I'd like to ask, ask him is that given the, the number, I'd like to know your views on what actors are we going to address in this whole question about sustainability of space and adding transparency and confidence building to our activities. Well, uh, space being the common province of all mankind, being a vantage point, it presents myriad opportunities to serve humanity and assist in keeping the health of our planet. It indeed serves multiple objectives, being a unique environment, as uh, has been you know, explained by Mr. Harikova. It is an arena for exploration, for expanding now. It is an arena for pursuing the utilitarian applications. It is an area for bestowing strategic capability for the countries. And it is an area for promoting cooperation and peace. Seeing in this context, of course, we can see who are the actors who determine the sustainability of space? We have a very unique legal environment for uh, space activities. Essentially, space is free for exploration by all countries, irrespective of their state of economic, social, or scientific development. States bear responsibility for activities in space, including the activities by private sector under their jurisdiction. Freedom of exploration of space should take into account interests of other countries. They should not cause interference. So broadly, this legal environment defines the bounds of activities of states while giving freedom for all states. The governments therefore have predominant role. They act through policies, they act through regulations, they act through providing investments into space, and they act through becoming demand engines for space activities. However, government is a very complex system driven by multiple interests. We have civilian agencies using this space. We have security or defense agencies who are using this space. In fact, if we look at uh, the space activities in the just last decade, uh, the defense agencies, the, the mass launched into space has grown more than threefold by the military agencies. 26 tons or so in 2001 has grown to 88 tons in 2011. So the activities of security agencies, the defense agencies are growing. The number of countries which are entering into space activities are also growing. When we take a globe as a whole, we have mix of government entities. 
namely we have a few spacefaring nations who have capabilities the total capabilities for not only making uh, space objects but also having capability to launch them into various orbits they are important of course but there are a large number of countries who are depending on space who are using space there are also active space players so we have a mix of different state entities even in the government system further we also have intergovernmental organizations who drive and promote programs you can see the diversity of the government actors then let us come to the private entity if we look at the commercial space commercial space activities have been growing uh, the overall revenues of commercial sector are exceeding the investments put into government in the space activities these commercial space investors are very important because they are innovative they design systems they operate systems they create markets so we can say all this side of the balance is there are the supply engines for the space activities there are again in the private sector we have uh, diversity of actors we have spacecraft operators we have launch providers we have even insurance community who play an important role in risk mitigation activities and so on there is a third category of actors that is the research community their actions expand the knowledge and the tools because they create innovations they conceive missions they lead to unexplored territories which result in several spin off activities you can see in the last several years many universities across the world engaging in uh, making very innovative small nano satellites which are getting into the or orbit so all these three categories of actors are very important in the context of uh, when we talk about the sustainability of space activities thank you very much dr moti for for this overview on on the different categories of actors you briefly touched also the issue of regulation and we can leave that uh, to be uh, introduced uh, by Tari Brisebi uh, from the perspective of the legal subcommittee of the United Nations Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I should, especially given um, the excellent overview that's been provided by um, Mr. Sushi Horikawa. Note that, and based on the introduction um, with respect to the legal subcommittee, that the framework which we are considering that will be applicable to sustainability in outer space, and in as much as there's a body of international law, um, should also take into consideration national laws to begin with. Um, and I mention this specifically because of your reference to regulations. So you could consider regulations in the purely international legal context um, based on the sorts of entities or actors um, which Mr. Murphy um, has kindly detailed. But at the same time, besides these treaties and principles which are applicable to states and government entities, we should um, also critically examine um, the mechanisms and instruments by which international obligations are implemented by states through national legislation. It's important that we keep this overarching um, framework in mind, which has 
worked successfully and been in existence over five decades. Um, but more specifically, in the context of sustainability, there are, I suppose, broadly two questions um, that we should address our minds to. On the one hand, the question of establishing fault, I suppose, because again, we want to be able to identify the entities that are responsible, perhaps um, impute liability um, to those entities. Um, we also want to be able to establish standards of care and diligence. Um, and I should, you know, in that context, refer to the opening remarks um, of Mr. Hodgkins and the fact that today we witness um, a process that is in fact considering standards of care and diligence in a multilateral context, which may well not have been feasible um, decades ago when the liability convention um, was negotiated. I should also uh, make reference to questions pertaining to especially procedures that we should consider regarding abandoned space objects in outer space specifically. Overall, and considering the mechanisms by which, on the one hand, international legal instruments are generated, um, the freedom and rights and processes by which states implement these international obligations, in the context of the topic that we discuss, it's important, again, referring to Mr. Yasushi Horikawa's statement of the role of international cooperation, which I should highlight. The reason being that over five decades ago, when this framework was established, one of the still enduring guiding principles, in addition to the obligation to register space objects, was the guidance based on international cooperation, which states should undertake in the conduct of their activities in outer space. This principle is extremely still relevant today, on the one hand. On the other, I should also make reference to the possibility that states have in the context of parliamentary diplomacy, relying on consultation, which in layman's language might well be a meeting of minds, but in a strictly legal context, is probably the most established and oldest means by which states resolve disputes between themselves. Thank you. Maybe I can uh, add one further question. Uh, as, as you certainly are aware, uh, the space debris issue, space debris mitigation, but in the future also space debris removal, uh, is, is uh, 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 an important, very important element of, of sustainable uses of outer space. Now, we have guidelines which have been uh, discussed and adopted by the main committee, the UN COPUAS, but the legal subcommittee has not yet been able or allowed to by the member states to draft a text on space debris. Uh, you as the chairman, what, what, what is your feeling? Uh, when will the legal subcommittee of UN COPUAS be able to discuss and possibly adopt the text on space debris? Thank you very much. Um, and perhaps to provide clarification, as I indicated earlier, um, there are various mechanisms and processes by which this body um, responsible for creating international space law um, could perform its duties. On the one hand, you could have treaties, instruments which are binding, are clear, um, they are negotiated, there are pros and cons of pursuing instruments in that fashion. On the other hand, you could also have the possibility of states implementing voluntarily um, a practice that essentially becomes accepted and in that form generates customary law. So the options really um, are open to member states, again as I indicated, in a parliamentary, diplomatic, multilateral context, which I hope we will be able to arrive at a consensus in respect of soon. Thank you. Ken. Okay, uh, Professor Marchesio, how is the uh, EU draft code of conduct addressing safety and sustainability issues? Thank you, Ken. Uh, I should say that uh, the very title of this international instrument, this proposal, reveals the intent of the proponent 
you are uh, speaking about a core, you are speaking of an instrument that uh, aims at consolidating rules of behavior, for, mainly for states and other actors that can be uh, uh, of the same nature of the states. It doesn't address the conduct of the private operators, uh, but it is an instrument that, as I said, try to consolidate existing rules of behavior and build upon them. Uh, it contain, it, it is known that this initiative uh, was taken by <coughs> the European Union in 2007 within the uh, pillar uh, concerning the common foreign policy of the European Union. And then it was, uh, uh, is, uh, if I may say, uh, open to the accession in, to have an international dim dimension, uh, and it was joined by uh, several other states, which now form a group of like-minded states that promote this initiative, discuss it, and uh, try to make uh, this kind of uh, instrument accepted by the uh, vast majority of states. It is uh, still an you know, ongoing process. Uh, it is uh, shape, shaped in a, in, in a form that can be uh, said is a, a, a sort of a, a treaty uh, format, even not being legal binding, and uh, it contains uh, political commitments that uh, regards, uh, of course, safety, security, and sustainability in space. But the main part of the code, uh, which is uh, divided in several parts and sections, uh, is the part concerning the uh, measures in space operations and the principles of behavior of the code. It contains also a cooperation and consultation mechanism and an organization uh, it is uh, uh, well known that this initiative, uh, of course, is uh, uh, intended to be complementary with regard to other uh, initiatives in the same field and uh, doesn't deal with the placement of weapons in space, uh, doesn't want to overlap with other initiatives that are, uh, have been tabled uh, in the Commission of Disarmament of the United Nations, such as the uh, initiative of Russia and China, uh, prohibiting the placement of weapons in outer space. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is more directed to consolidate best practices and uh, rules of behavior for a responsible behavior in outer space. Thank well, you. we. Um, <coughs> We have learned that there will be uh, three major initiatives uh, coming to a close, maybe in 2014, 2015. Can introduce that, uh, saying that first, in the United Nations, there are, or the UN COPUAS, there is a, a big machinery going on uh, discussing the issue of sustainable uses of outer space. We have now heard about the code of conduct. Uh, tabled uh, by the European Union. The third element is the uh, governmental group of experts uh, set up by the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. And this is dealing or, or coming from the perspective of transparency and confidence building measures. One of the purposes of, of, of this plenary, of course, is to, to make you familiar, to inform you about these uh, three initiatives and raise your awareness. And so we have also invited uh, one personality um, participating in this field. But we also invited uh, Ms. Jana Robinson from a, a think tank from the European Space Policy Institute. And uh, my question addressed to both of them now is, uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Robinson, from the think tank uh, perspective, what are transparency and confidence building measures in outer space and what, what is their general use? And then turning to Gérard Brachet, explaining to us what is currently 
going on in this um, uh, working group and what the perspectives are in practice of dealing with uh, transparency and confidence building measures and how they can contribute to the sustainable use of outer space. First, Ms. Robinson. Thank you, Kaiwe. Um, so space security uh, is increasingly uh, being viewed from the perspective of uh, self-interest uh, by space actors seeking to protect their assets in a congested and uh, contested space environment rather than merely a function of uh, terrestrial, nuclear and other security issues. And as we heard from uh, the previous panelists, uh, there are a number of international initiatives beyond formal treaties that govern space uh, designed to advance space safety and security focusing on responsible and predictable uh, behavior in space, including various proposals for transparency and confidence building measures, or TCBMs as uh, we all refer to them by now. However, uh, their implementation has lacked uh, for a number of reasons, including the asymmetric advantages and interests uh, in the space, uh, and the close connection between terrestrial tensions and space security, the lack of uh, a track record uh, on the aftermath and implications uh, of an incident or conflict in space, among other considerations. Um, proposals focusing, uh, there are also proposals focusing on banning uh, space weapons, in quotes, such as uh, the right Russian-Chinese uh, proposal for a treaty to prevent placement uh, of weapons in outer space, the so-called PPWT. In fact, one of the most contentious uh, uh, debates in, in the space security field has been over, the, uh, over what constitutes a space weapon. These debates uh, often distract from the promotion of a practical understanding uh, of space security the, that encompasses broader concerns, including uh, the expanding quantity of space debris and the increasing population of operational satellites and spacecraft. Tra TCBMs, uh, supported by space situational awareness, are widely viewed as practical tools that can advance these goals and their implementations. Naturally, uh, their effectiveness is heavily influenced uh, by the level of international support uh, they can attract. TCBMs are al already present uh, in existing legally binding space agreements. They have been introduced in various frameworks, including the UN General Assembly resolutions surface at the UNGA First Committee, a key sponsor of which has been Russia, the related group of government experts on TCBMs in outer space that will be uh, uh, introduced more by, by Mr. Brache and uh, this group that held its first session uh, in July 2012. Uh, the US uh, 2010 national space policy and its intention uh, to pursue near-term voluntary uh, and pragmatic TCBMs and the TCBMs introduced through the draft International Code of Conduct for Outer Space Activities. Existing TCBMs uh, for space carry benefits, uh, as well as some baggage. Both Russia and China, uh, which propose the CD-related TCBMs, are proponents of a legally binding treaty on banning space weapons that has not, as referenced early, uh, gained much uh, traction internationally. Um, there is also a history of terrestrial uh, TCBMs disappointments, especially uh, in the arms control and missile proliferation arenas. These mixed results complicate persuading some space actors of the benefits of TCBMs for uh, non-binding agreements. While acknowledging uh, their various uh, limitations, including the issue of verification, compliance and enforcement, uh, realistic TCBMs will almost certainly uh, play an essential role in diplomatic venues. Independent of uh, the specific space activities uh, being discussed, that is commercial, civilian, or military, it is highly desirable uh, that all actors conduct uh, their space activities responsibly and with an eye toward the international space community. Accordingly, it is uh, useful that uh, both top-down, uh, such as the code of conduct, and bottom-up approaches uh, for example, the space debris mitigation guidelines are available to strengthen space governance and can be pursued simultaneously uh, to achieve the optimal and or most expeditious uh, outcome. 
Uh, the TCBMs should not require countries to sacrifice their national goals uh, in space, but uh, rather enhance their pursuit of such goals. They can also be modi modified in a manner that promotes the type of international cooperation, confidence and trust that will be necessary in, uh, in uh, uh, an ever more complex and congested space environment. Although the culture of transparency and trust uh, is difficult to embrace, it is uh, essential that such efforts continue uh, as the stakes uh, for the humankind are simply too high to do otherwise. Even after signing, for example, an international code of conduct and other meaningful efforts, um, I don't envision the need for TCBMs subsiding. On the contrary, uh, TCBMs will always be necessary uh, given the more sophisticated, complex challenges to space security uh, that accompany the introduction of new technologies, space actors, and counter space capabilities. In short, uh, states possessing an advanced understanding and commitment to international law and space diplomacy are going to be essential to the formulation of a more creative and persuasive space transparency and confidence building measures. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kayua. Um, as uh, you know, Vincent just uh, told you, uh, the uh, GGE, a uh, group of governmental experts, uh, has been established uh, by the Secretary General of the United Nations following a proposal by Russia, uh, supported by many other countries, uh, at the uh, General Assembly in 2010. Uh, and the idea was, in fact, to try to move forward on transparency and confidence building in outer space uh, following the deadlock that uh, happened at the uh, Conference on Disarmament. The deadlock on the issues of the CD is not related to outer space, it's related to other issues, but it has a consequence that discussion on the prevention of arms race in outer space actually is not making any progress at the CD. Uh, so the uh, Russian a delegation who is very active on this topic uh, has uh, proposed to uh, instead try to uh, make some step forward via the creation of the group of governmental experts. So this was adopted in a resolution in 2010 and the uh, group uh, was set up by the Secretary General towards the end of 2011, early 2012. For your information, the uh, the GGE is composed of 15 experts uh, which are coming from the following countries. Uh, Brazil, Chile, China, France, Italy, uh, Kazakhstan, the Republic of Korea, Nigeria, uh, Romania, Russia, uh, what is it? Uh, okay, Russia, uh, Sri Lanka, South Africa, the US, Ukraine, and United Kingdom. I think I've not forgotten any. Uh, I said. Yeah. So I, I don't need to repeat that. You have all noted down. Okay. Uh, this is just for your information, the spread of, uh, of uh, uh, countries who have designated their experts to participate in the GGE. Now, the GGE uh, met uh, for the first time in uh, July at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Uh, and uh, the purpose of this first meeting was to uh, agree on the goals and objectives of the GGE. Uh, which uh, uh, to a large extent uh, was achieved uh, and also to agree on the work plan. And uh, we uh, in fact uh, found an agreement relatively easily on the work plan uh, leading to a draft of the report of the GGE being uh, available for discussion at the next meeting uh, planned for the early part of April 2013 and that will take uh, place in Geneva. Uh, of course, that means that a lot of action is taking place between now and, uh, and April. And uh, various experts are uh, 
uh, preparing their contribution to the uh, report of the GGE. So uh, I would say that it is much too early to say the, if this exercise will be a successful one. Uh, but I would uh, uh, still uh, mention the fact that there is a good agreement among the experts uh, participating in the GGE that uh, it would be a very useful step forward to be able to produce by consensus a report suggesting a number of transparency and confidence building measures that could be acceptable by the uh, world community. This report uh, eventually uh, will uh, be uh, submitted by the Secretary General to the General Assembly and the plan is to do that in uh, uh, at the, the fall of 2013. So the, the uh, uh, schedule is rel relatively tight. Uh, I think Kayowe was referring to 2014-2015. Well, the GGE plan is to produce something in 2013, which is basically uh, less than a year from now. And uh, whether we will be successful, that uh, little too early to say. But uh, but I think it has one advantage, and that is uh, having a tight schedule uh, put a lot of pressure on the GGE to. Uh, produce something useful and uh, for which a consensus can be reached in a relatively short time. Um, of course, there is a number of uh, elements which are common to the efforts uh, led uh, by the, uh, the, the U uh, European Union in promoting the International Code of Conduct. Uh, and uh, this uh, is one thing that we, we will be trying to achieve, and that is that uh, uh, anything that we are developing the GG uh, would have to be at least, at least consistent uh, with uh, what the uh, proposed uh, code of conduct uh, is, uh, uh, contains. Uh, many of us in the GG are very familiar with the uh, code of conduct initiative. Uh, many of us also in the GG are very familiar with the UN COPIO's uh, Long-Term Sustainability or Space Activities Working Group, and therefore the, uh, the um, consistency between these various initiatives is uh, uh, ensured by the fact that many of the people are actually participating in at least two, if not three, of, the say of, of these three initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, now you've, you've um, all heard the, the, about the three separate activities that are, that are going on, the GGE, the, the International Code of Conduct, and the long-term sustainability of space activities. So I I'll add a, a fourth element to this, which is, despite all of those exercises, we do have an existing body of international space law that's codified in five treaties and UN uh, principles. And the question that I'd like to ask Mr. Lee is, in, in your view, how do we build on the fact that we already have obligations undertaken by states within these, uh, within these treaties and principles, and how do we ensure that the, uh, how do we make sure that these other three activities remain kind of consistent with the, with the treaties? Uh, how do we avoid any conflicts in terms of obligations or responsibilities that states might have? Uh, as a result of the of, of not only the treaties but the other three activities. Thank you. <laughs> Under the institu situation that it is diff it was difficult for international community to establish a comprehensive and effective. Uh, a legal system on sustainable use of our space. So I think uh, we can and we had to build on existing legal provisions under the framework of the United Nations. And because and some um, existing legal provisions provided good principles and provisions on sustainable use of our space. For example, um, the Article 4 of our Space Treaty and uh, 
Article 1 and 2 of Convention on Prohibition of Military and Hostile Use of Environment Modification Technique, and Article 3 of Moon Agreement, and Article 1 of Partial uh, uh, partial uh, test ban treaty, and uh, also the Article 9 of uh, Outer Space Treaty and uh, Article 7 of uh, Moon Agreement, and uh, also I think the Article 4 of uh, Red Tree Convention. This provision is very important for us, for international to uh, the terrible use of uh, Outer Space. Out space. And also otherwise, uh, moreover, and I think, and uh, a lot of provisions in international documents, and also we can build on. For example, the uh, guideline of space debris mitigation by UN Corpus, and uh, the principles of relevant to use of uh, nuclear power sources, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so sources in outer space, and also uh, some articles in International Code of Conduct against uh, ballistic missile proliferation. And so, and uh, these provisions, and we can build on. So, uh, I say we can build on existing uh, legal provisions to maintain. And the sustainable use of our space. Of course, of course, these provisions is not enough, not enough. Uh, for example, uh, there are a lot of uh, provisions about security in our space. For example, Article 4 of our space treaty and uh, Article uh, 3 of the Moon Agreement. But the limitation of this, lim uh, this provision is uh, uh, obvious, is clear, is clear. For example, uh, it didn't provide prevention of convention, uh, uh, prevention of uh, placing uh, in orbit, uh, in orbit any object carrying convention weapon, convention weapon. And also, it didn't provide uh, comprehensive provisions about TCBMS. And also, it didn't provide any provisions about prevention of armed race in outer space and the threat and the use of force against space objects. Space objects. And also, it didn't provide any uh, provision about space debris mitigation in existing legal provisions. So, uh, international shall do more to establish a, a comprehensive uh, legal system to maintain the terrible uh, use of uh, outer space. Outer space. And, uh, uh, as uh, uh, the, uh, some professors mentioned in the discussion, and uh, the UN and the uh, EU, uh, uh, they do their best to uh, establish uh, uh, some uh, uh, legal uh, documents. For example, the International Code of, uh, Code of Conduct by EU and, uh, and the UN Corpus. UN couples, they are doing the best to establish uh, some measures to maintain the sustainable use, uh, use of outer space. And in my opinion, I think, and uh, actually, it is the uh, ideal reason for the international community to establish a legal, pro a comprehensive legal provision, including uh, all respects. And about I think it is possible for the international uh, community to establish a international documents under the uh, framework of the United Nations, just like the International Code of Conduct uh, done by uh, UN, by UN, not by, by EU. Uh, 
under, uh, in my opinion, the uh, documents at least shall include three key clauses, three key provisions. One is to take all, st all t uh, states shall take adequate measures to implement, implement the guideline of space activities by UN purpose. And the second, and shall be including the provisions about uh, TCBMX. Uh, and the third, I think the provisions shall include in provisions about prevention of uh, armed race in outer space and threat and the use of our, uh, use of force against space uh, object. So this is my uh, opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are almost at the end uh, of our plenary session of the roundtable here. You have heard uh, the views of uh, the most uh, important institutions or activities uh, in that field on the global level. You have also seen uh, a wide variety, a, a, a large uh, Europe, uh, regional representation. Uh, we have not been able to touch issues like, for example, uh, why states uh, should actually limit their freedom of activities in outer space for the benefit of a long-term sustainability. We did not touch issues like the question of uh, whether or not we might need to have uh, provisions being enforceable, because we do not have that uh, so far. But, but these might be issues for, for upcoming roundtables. So from my uh, side, I would like uh, to thank uh, all the participants and hand over to uh, Ken for, for a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Well, I think this was a highly uh, interesting discussion. Uh, looking to the future, I think one of our uh, major challenges for, for all of these activities is, is to ensure that they're consistent that they're clear and that they don't create confusion among states as to what in what of these instruments uh, is more important than than the other. Right? There there is a real uh, possibility of of, of uh, creating some kind of some conflicting obligations within these exercises because they are being taken up uh, s separately. So the challenge would be to make sure that those states that are involved in these these discussions try to take steps to make sure there's there's consistency because otherwise it will, it will create more uh, more problems than, than, it's, than they're worth. Uh, I think the other aspect that we have to look at is what happens after 2014 when much of this work is completed. Uh, I know that in the case of the long-term sustainability discussions in, in the UN, we're looking at things that are easily implementable in the near term and the medium term, and then there are probably will be other issues that have to be considered in the, in the long term. So that will be the, the, the next challenge. How do we build on the work that we've already completed by, by 2014? So as Kaiwi mentioned, that's going to be uh, ripe for further discussion within the, the IAC and other forums. Thank you. Thank you.